Cheers. For the Marine Ecosystem Collaboration Team. And uh, just as background, um, uh, just a reminder, the Arctic is one of the most rapidly changing regions on Earth. The region is experiencing unprecedented warming at a faster rate than elsewhere on the planet. Climate change impacts the ability of Arctic communities to harvest food and to safely travel and poses threats to infrastructure, housing, and economic development. And what's happening in the Arctic has huge implications for the rest of the world. And just to name a few of those factors, melting glaciers lead to sea level rise that threatens coastal communities all over the globe. Thawing permafrost releases greenhouse gases that accelerate global warming and melting sea ice can no longer reflect heat away from the planet. And directed by law, IARPIC develops and implements a five-year plan and, and we're in the process of refining the plan for 2022 to 2026. The plan itself is drafted on the intent of the US federal agencies and on the research needs of Northern communities and on the non-federal research family. So this new Arctic research plan provides a bold vision for federal agencies to help nimbly and collaboratively understand and support resilience in the face of these changes. And the plan itself provides future goals for the IARPIC collaboration teams to address topics that will advance understanding solutions and policies in the Arctic. Slide. If you took part in our plan development process, this graphic might look familiar to you, though it has been updated and it shows the structure of the plan. The top section shows four policy drivers. That is areas where Arctic research supports US policy. These directly connect to the other elements of the plan. In the center in red, you'll see four priority areas with icons indicating which policy drivers they support. The priority areas represent areas of broad cross-cutting research focus, and each has a goal that drives the plan. The priority areas are community resilience and health, Arctic systems interactions, sustainable economies and livelihoods, and risk management and hazard mitigation. Below the priority areas in blue are the foundational areas, and these activities are essential to achieving the priority areas and will remain foundation to Arctic research beyond the five-year duration of the plan. And these in brief are data management, education, training, and capacity building, monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction, participatory research, and indigenous leadership and research, and technology innovation and application. Um, finally, in the center, you'll see the IARPIC logo, which is the iceberg, and this represents the IARPIC collaborations platform, which we'll use to put the plan in action. Slide. The Arctic is changing at an uh, unprecedented pace while planning on a five-year cycle allows us to be relatively nimble. Things are changing so quickly um, that novel changes, things like the COVID-19 pandemic arise within five-year periods. With that in mind, IARPIC is moving to a biennial implementation process for the plan. And while the Arctic research plan provides high-level strategy and goals, these two-year implementation plans will be more granular, providing specific and tangible objectives and deliverables. This planning structure will also provide opportunities for Arctic researchers and residents to drive the work we do. This is an exciting time to be involved with the IARPIC as they make the shift towards implementing the Arctic research plan for the next five years. And we see this new approach to implementation as a big step in being more responsive to emerging research questions and to engage new people from across federal agencies as well as the outside federal government. Um, during uh, this time period, January through March, IARPIC is holding public meetings such as these to solicit ideas on topics to be pursued within each priority area. So again, thanks for joining us today and make your voices heard. Slide. The biennial implementation plan will include objectives and deliverables for each priority area and foundational activity. Um, here on the slide are the definitions for that. Uh, we'll now review quickly the priority areas and their goals and some preliminary uh, draft objectives. 
As noted previously, the objectives of deliverables are still in the early stages of development. And if you have specific thoughts on how your planned or proposed research may advance goals identified in this plan, we'd love to be able to summarize that. Slide. The first goal um, of community resilience and health priority area is to improve community resilience and well being by strengthening research and developing tools to increase understanding of interdependent social, natural, and built systems in the Arctic. And the next slide covers um, the four preliminary focus areas that will help uh, public engagement on the topic. And those include evaluate threats to food safety and security and develop solutions to improve availability of nutritious subsistence and market-based foods, support physical and mental health of Arctic residents through research on public health needs, disparities and delivery, support integrative approaches to cultural health, wellness and resiliency, and finally promote research on access to safe and reliable infrastructure with relevance to human health and well-being. Slide. The goal of the Arctic Systems Interaction Priority is to enhance our ability to observe, understand, and predict and project the Arctic's dynamic interconnected systems and their links to the Earth system. Slide. This team has a few areas of focus as it considers draft objectives. Some of the ones that they've been talking about are Arctic ecosystems change research, which could include the role of the Arctic in the global carbon cycle. For example, as sources and sinks of carbon dioxide and methane, also marine and terrestrial ecosystem changes, and the impacts of Arctic ecosystem change and the effects on human health and food security. The second is Arctic amplification and mid latitude connections, both in terms of atmosphere and ocean. For example, the implications of Arctic change on ocean circulation. The third is uh, the interactions among ice, atmosphere, and ocean and land, um, for example, the role of sea ice in ocean ecosystem health, as well as food security. So I'd like to highlight um, these points here on this slide uh, might have some specific relevance to our MET group. Uh, moving on to the next slide. The goal of the sustainable economies and livelihoods priority area is to observe and understand the Arctic's natural social and built systems to promote sustainable economies and livelihoods. And on the next slide, some of the areas of research they are considering include ecosystem health assessments, models and forecasts, community economic priorities, uh, the ability to map or leverage available capacity and uh, providing a general understanding of community and regional intersections and dependencies. Slide. The goal of the risk management and hazard mitigation priority area is to secure and improve quality of life through research that promotes an understanding of disaster risk exposure, sensitive, sensitivity to hazard and adaptive capacity. And on the next slide, uh, the priority area is considering questions such as what data tools and technologies are needed to increase understanding of Arctic ecosystems, to improve hazard mitigation and adaptive capacity? And how can we better share this data or information? How do we increase our understanding of how environmental change will affect current and future adaptive capacity and resiliency? And then finally, how can we better understand how hazards, both acute and chronic, will affect critical infrastructure? Um, the next slide uh, talks a little bit about the uh, guiding foundational areas that I mentioned before, uh, data management, um, education, training, and capacity building. The, um, they call it the MOMP team, the monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction, and then participatory research and indigenous leadership and research, and finally, technology and innovation. And so um, the next slide just uh, brings um, the point of why we're meeting here today is uh, discussing the most important research questions to be answered during the next year. Uh, thanks for you, uh, those of you that filled out the survey. Um, so we'd love to start that discussion. And we're also happy to answer any questions um, relating to the plan or the plan process. And then finally, on the, the last slide, uh, Meredith, thank you, um, is that to remind you that the IARPIC website 
and social media platforms has a ton of up-to-date information and we encourage you to take a look at it often. Thank you. Okay, I see a few questions um, in the chat, um, but, and I see a hand raised, uh, Kate. Hi, um, thanks for that, Kathy. And um, I specifically wanted to ask you about the BOEM uh, DWM program that I think I'm gonna be taking part in this fall along with Karen Ashton, where we present proposed research activities to native stakeholders and have them give us feedback before we actually submit proposals. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little more on that. Well, um, that's a great and, question. And how that affects IARPIC, because it seems to me like that process fits really well into a number of the IARPIC goals. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, question, um, Kate. And um, I might have to get back to you on like the specific details of that. But I think, um, you know, I think it would be worthwhile to, you know, I don't know what the process is with that project, but you know, once you hear back um, from those proposals or topics, it would really be, I think, an interesting set of conversations to have with both, you know, this collaboration team um, as well as the, um, you know, community resilience team that I think uh, Christina Bonsell is on here for. So um, I don't like have a, a specific way. I think that it'll fold into IARBIC. Um, off the top of my head, but I think that we'd like to um, hear, you know, those comments from the communities as what are the valuable pieces of the, you know, of the ecosystem that they're wanting to understand. Sure, and I, I think maybe what Karen and I can do is provide feedback after the fact as to the process, what what was helpful, what was maybe less helpful, but also get feedback because um, it's going to depend upon what community. But anyway. Um, that immediately jumped to mind. Yeah, well, actually then building on that, you know, I think with the, the structure of the plan of, of looking at it and Daniel, maybe you have a different or Jackie, a different perspective, but like when they're doing the biennial implementation plans, you know, if we can identify key things, you know, that communities are in the ecosystem that uh, we want to better understand or, or to see if those questions can be addressed by, you know, um, a variety of researchers, uh, that would be really helpful. So I think we could do it in a couple different ways. And if Francis has a question, a couple of them. Kathy, he's asking you, uh, are the priorities in the phase are great and line well, where we have drivers, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Maybe they're just comments. Sorry. Next it, sorry, Jackie. The, the, I have a question. <laughs> the second one was a comment. The first one was a question. Um, right. Do it. Uh, I was wondering about the, the foundational activities that you had in that in that uh, first graphic, which I think are really important. So the capacity building, the you know, um, including indigenous knowledge and participatory research, etc. And I guess I was wondering if whether those are meant to be um, you sort of there's individual uh, things you're doing for those uh, that are just going in the background. They're going on all the time or whether they're meant to be baked into everything else, like so those other areas that you have, so that when, when on every focus area, you wanna make sure that those activities are, are components of those. I would, go ahead, please. I can answer that question. Um, so the intent is, is both. Um, so there will be foundational activity, activities in each of the priority areas, Although in the first biennial implementation plan, some foundational activities might have um, more of a specific focus in one or two of the priority areas um, because it's uh, hard to do everything all at once. Um, but the foundational activities also have um, some of their own objectives that they are drafting and working on. And I can um, share in the chat a link to more information about what those um, specific objectives are to the foundational activities. That'd be great. Thanks, Meredith. Okay, Gay. 
Yeah, I just have a, a question kind of because of what Kate was talking about. What, what do you mean by community approval? Or, or what do you mean by the word you use the term community loosely? Yeah. Is that tribal? Is that a transportation hub? Is that one native community, native leadership? What does that mean when you say community and approval for people to do their projects? It's interesting. But I think the word community is often loosely used and I think it's helpful to really define whether you're talking Alaska Native leadership, government approval, um, you know, community, that's a big, big broad term out here. I'm in Nome, so um, we have all kinds of levels, if that's helpful. Yeah, um, I think I'd like to start with an answer and then um, see if anybody else wants to add on to that. And Gay, that's a really good question. I mean, me living in Anchorage, you know, which is I know the big city and probably a little bit detached from rural Alaska, my perspective of what community is, is, is both. It's, um, you know, people that live uh, in towns all over the state, um, but also, you know, tribal organizations um, or governments. But I wasn't, I didn't, th I hope I didn't say approval. I think I was saying, I was meaning to say inputs. Okay, um, no, that's good. I, I think it does, and I'll, I'll stop, but I, I think it is really important for the words to be used correctly because in er, rural Alaska, it is a big difference whether you're asking about tribal or NGO, and you should know who's an NGO or not, you know, for a region and how each, re there's layers and layers to the onion out here, and they're all really important. Um, so, Careful when you use community. That's all. It's it's when you're listening in rural Alaska, you're really trying to figure out what you, what urban based is really talking about because it it will trigger who's involved and who's not and why and all that. It makes a difference for rural Alaska. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gay. Danielle, did you have another like additional uh, perspective? I know that you know some of the work that you've done um, communicating um, with. Uh, regional hubs when you were doing the MPRB, I, I, or do you have like any thoughts on better terminology or things that you would like to share based on that experience? Um, I don't off the top of my head, Kathy. I think um, in every case, um, how communication is handled for a given project is going to necessarily be different and it's going to be approached differently. If, for example, you're a federal agency with a real government to government um, responsibility versus, you know, uh, a nonprofit, you know, a, a privately funded or academic research project where you're trying to, um, you know, communicate with a community and really move towards something like co-production of knowledge and bring people in, whether that be through um, the inclusion of community-based observers in the research or um, having folks that are directly um, relevant to the research community contribute to the analysis that you're doing. I think all of those are really valuable things um, to think about carefully um, from every at every stage of research from the initial planning um, all the way through to communicating the results. But I think that will necessarily look different depending on what sort of project you're doing. But I would love to see our collaboration team host some discussions to share. Um, things like, you know, what has worked in the past for um, various research projects and how can we all learn from that um, and, and move towards uh, collectively doing this better. Um, and I'm really excited that the new Arctic research plan really put some emphasis on that. And, and I'm quite excited that we have Harmony joining us who is from a, a community like Knack Knack and has those connections with salmon fishers and, and others who, and hope she can pull some of her friends into the conversation and we can grow this, um, this community of the Marine Ecosystems Collaboration Team to, to collectively do better. Um, thank you. Um, I see in the chat um, that um, Kate asked about the Tamanta program, um, and that's a new uh, program uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I think that the Secretariat is uh, going to start uh, some conversations with them. I had the opportunity just as part of my uh, home bureau to listen to the construct of how that uh, uh, 
program will work for um, masters and PhD, I believe, uh, level students. I can't remember if it's undergrad, but uh, it's really um, impressive um, and that they're really trying to do a broad uh, reach and encourage students um, to apply. Um, and they're giving like really some good hands-on um, uh, help to even like apply into the program. So I think there'll be some really solid uh, potential uh, synergies with uh, some potential um, masters or doctoral projects that could come out of the uh, new program with UAF. And if anybody has the opportunity, I know that UAF is reaching out really broadly with that. And if you have the opportunity to, you know, call into one of their meetings or they have some informational webinars out there, um, I was really um, Im impressed. Um, from what I've heard so far, Kate. I see what uh, Franz um, wrote. So thanks, Franz. Um, maybe we can remedy that. Um, Franz said that he, as a faculty of UAF, um, has got some loose affiliations with the program, and he doesn't know of a current good mechanism to connect to IRBIC. So um, let's make a change on that. I think that would be a, a good synergy. Anything? Yeah, just to, sorry, just to follow up on that. I mean, I think it would be uh, probably a useful connection, but um, uh, you know, it's a matter of capacity to, um, you know, it's focused on education and uh, bringing uh, Indigenous students into the program and kind of indigenizing the way we teach about fisheries. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's some obvious uh, potential synergies, um, but it, the focus is on, on uh, kind of the educational aspects here. I think um, the more we can just bring individual students, individual people into uh, the marine ecosystems collaboration team, um, the, the better we can, you know, create those opportunities for for communication. And, you know, we have, for example, Lyle Britt here from NOAA uh, Fisheries on, you know, uh, in this webinar. And if there were some Tumumta students here, you know, we'd have a nice opportunity for to facilitate communication. So, um, you know, the more we can host, host um, webinars with titles that are compelling from a science perspective or from a um, relevance perspective to bring those individuals into the conversation, the better. And that's where I think we would love to get some input from all of you today. And please share that survey form with your colleagues. You know, help us figure out what those compelling science questions are that would bring people into the conversation and, and get them coming back because, you know, we host these things every month and the more we can build rapport among everybody who participates month by month, the, the better off we'll be in terms of creating a community where that kind of communication can better happen. And I see Gay waving her hand. So Gay, um, please can, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks Danielle. I was just curious and I'm probably the, the lowest on the poll around in this, in this crowd. So it's nice to see everybody. Uh, but it, one way or one question I have is there's a lot of research that the agencies currently are unable to, to proceed with and they need help. And there, there are things that are already sort of mandatory, regulatory, you know, are the ice seals okay? Are the numbers good? How are the walrus? Are they got a heavy contaminant load? There's a lot of regular questions that the managers can't even get at. Is, is, is the research that you're wanting to do, I mean, I know you want something that makes everybody jump on board, but is there a way that research can help with the fundamentals that we've been trying, people, agencies have been trying to crack at? You know, they may only have, for example, the direction and funding to do an aerial survey, but the constituency, native and non-native, in an area may be really interested in, I'm making this up, contaminants. So if there's already existing efforts for really good topics, but they're not being fulfilled due to lack of people, lack of funding, da, 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 um, and they've already been addressed as important. Is that of interest or a, a 
an opportunity? Absolutely, Kathy, I did, do you I mind if I respond? Uh, and, and I see Jackie's got her hand up too. I Absolutely, Gay, and we would love to be able to help address these things. And for example, our collaboration team had, um, la you know, last year started a series that we hope to continue in the next five-year plan to, for example, uh, address opportunities for basic science projects like long-term monitoring programs to also address applied science needs, whether that be from the perspective of a resource management agency like a NOAA Fisheries or Fish and Wildlife Service, or um, from an applied need as far as a community relevance perspective and providing data that's relevant to what people in coastal communities need. And we'd love to have more um, suggestions for specific topics um, like that. We had one on marine sound, um, for example, um, in the last few months um, this fall about um, you know, how, to, how do we uh, look for opportunities to address marine sound through basic science programs. Um, and so I think, you know, for example, you know, might it be useful for um, federal agencies, for example, Lyle or others to talk about, you know, here's what, what we're limited in terms of our capacity to do with federal funding and here's some needs. And if we hosted conversations like that through a platform like IARPIC, could the academic community listen to that and think about how, as they're putting in proposals to um, renew long-term monitoring programs and that sort of thing, how could opportunities be seized to also collect data that's relevant to these applied needs? Um, so I look like Jackie has her hand up um, and I'm excited that she does. She's quite familiar with this from the perspective of the DBO and uh, Russ as well uh, has his hand up. So I'm excited to hear what they have to say. No, what I would say, and I'd answer the gay, and also with some of the survey results, I mean, an example, I mean, it's not just the scientists looking at the response to maybe a webinar, it's the agencies that are sponsoring those like uh, particular questions that actually used to be called performance elements within, you know, and one of them, there was a harmful algal bloom, and that was brought up, you know, the, the network that occurs and how that influ interacts with food security issues. So we've had a couple of webinars on that and getting feedback so what I'm saying is that the questions that are brought up, uh, they're highlighted in here, the agencies have to be looking, taking some feedback from that. And that's something that IARPIC is supposed to do. I mean, it goes to the principle. So we as scientists are, are, are providing these webinars or having these discussions, but at the same time, the agency sponsors such as Kathy Kuhn or Danielle, who's a program manager are seeing that, and then they have their own principal meetings. So I think they're, where can they address things that are maybe one agency can't do it alone? So there was a way then that through the network of IARPIC to say, okay, this is a real priority area. We don't have enough in our agency. How do we leverage that? And so I think this is a platform actually from a bottom up, but there's a top down aspect to it that we don't see because I'm not a Fed, right? So I can't even join those meetings, but Kathy Kuhn can, so. <laughs> So what I'm saying is besides, I think these webinars provide the platform of which we can have some of the discussions. And we had a lot of that to build this five-year plan. And so I think if things are missing, we need to bring that up. And if there are ways that people have suggestions of addressing those questions, uh, or you wanna see something discussed where we have, we have cross-link, like we're planning to have on the modeling, or we did that with Danielle leadership on that, so that we can say, how do you take, how do you develop ecosystem modeling? So. I think there's uh, there's room for the questions that are being brought up and also from the survey. So, and I noticed that uh, Meredith put the survey link in there. So it's not too late to fill something out and then we could try to build on that through, through these webinars. Thanks. Uh, Russ? Yeah, I was just gonna say, we can sit here and discuss the packaging and the degree of interconnectedness between things and what the process will be. But unless this is going to result in radical increases in efficiency and freeing up of people's time, uh, the real limitation here is resources to actually do something, not, not the debate about exactly how we should go about that and, and how we should make sure that all needs are simultaneously being addressed. I mean, how do we, do we get the important thing done, which is the resources to do the things that by and large we've agreed need to be done. Oh, 
Well, I guess I would just throw in there that I think that, yeah, how do you get that? You know, that's, I think that one of the things is the agencies, <laughs> until we get a federal government budget, but they do have plans to address some of the questions. And I think that it, it, we're probably going to have to leverage. And if we could give them fodder in which it would be of value to be able to, to address these that require more than one agency, then that does provide some food. I mean, there is a set budget, right? There and there's set requirements and the feds to have to do for, like Gay was saying, that to be, you know, by the regulatory aspects. But there's also, you know, basic science aspects to it. So I think that to bring it to light, and then, you know, if the I guess if you were to build a heat map and what are the key questions and who's doing them, and if there's a really hot part of those that where the intersection on that matrix and it's not being addressed, to me, that, that's a priority that needs to be brought forward to the funders. Since I see uh, uh, Lyle and Gay, so I'll, I don't know who's managing that, but go for it. I think Gay, then Lyle, then Harmony. I'm, I might have messed up the order. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> I think Lyle's first. Sorry, Lyle. He's a quick draw. It took me a, a long time to draw to figure out where to raise my hand here, and uh, uh, I'm not as uh, uh, Zoom uh, savvy. Uh, really, I mean, from an industry, uh, um, an agency perspective, I would say right now one of the situations that we're having is, you know, it was brought up, you know, budgets and whatnot. Is, you know, we've been pretty flat for a while now, and we've gotten to the point now where kind of trying to streamline our operations, we're starting to really have difficulty in meeting our platform needs. And with a group like IRPIC, one of the great things is, is once we can stabilize our platform needs, this becomes an incredible resource for, for setting up the collaborations to um, maximize the use of those platforms, you know, whether it be a ship, whether it be aircraft, whatever, depending upon the research that's going on. But um, that's kind of where our problems lie right now is we're trying to do everything we can to st uh, kind of stabilize our platform needs for, for working in the region. And uh, once we can try to do that, then I think we'll be in a good place. And that's where we start moving into kind of Jackie's comments where the more we can try to get our science out there, work with communities, we tend to um, can start to address some more of the um, real topical issues that are really critical to the region. Um, just as an example, one of the ones that came up from survey data from the bottom trawl survey that NOAA did last uh, summer in the Northern Bering Sea was a dramatic decline in um, uh, what are called tom cod up there, but we would refer to a saffron cod. And we're now trying to spin up research and trying to find ways to work with communities to address that need. Um, it moves slow. I mean, we can't steer that ship overnight, but we're trying to address that. And that comes out of those kinds of opportunities. And, and being able to leverage IRPIC to try to help do that work is great, but the platform needs is where we're really getting hung up right now. Gay, do you want to go next? Sure. I have a truck passing my house, so we'll hear about the talk of you guys. Um, uh, so my two cents were going to be for what kind of going on what Russ was talking about. I would say one of the biggest things out here in an area where we're sort of having this comprehensive transition environmentally, ecologically, industrially, and if you live in the Bering Strait region, we're bracing for military. Uh, and of course, uh, there's going to be some serious issues with the price of fuel um, out here. Right now we're cheaper than Fairbanks and our, our, we haven't, I don't think the city's bought the fuel yet for this year. So we're all wondering what the price will be, $10 a gallon, who knows. So um, rapid response, and I don't know, and maybe that's a little bit of what Lyle's talking about, you know, boom, there's an issue crops up. We have avian influenza that's, that's knocking on the door of Alaska really quickly here, coming up from both flyways. We have everything in the marine environment that's, that needs to be uh, looked at. There's the, the aspects of the human beings trying to, to adapt to this. How do we forecast ahead? So rapid response, how I would love a way for there to be a mechanism. And I don't know if IARPIC's the right place, but it seems like it would be to sort of be able to jump and help organize when rapid response is needed. And that would mean integrating 
with existing regional communication networks on the coast, because out here, people are the first ones to sort of, at least in the Bering Strait region, people see things and report, a, report them into uh, all different kinds of leadership and all different kinds of communication uh, focal points. Thank you. Thanks, Gay. Harmony, it looks like you had something you'd like to share. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to share quickly um, with a point about community engagement, like in seminars like this, I guess we just have to think about our audience. I think there's some cross noise, okay. Um, just think about who the audience is gonna be. And then if we're inviting local stakeholders, then to have like the key messages at the end of like, how is this gonna affect my daily life? Like for the harmful algal blooms, I kind of was missing the part of like, is it safe for me to go harvest like these species? Or like we talked about afterwards, like, oh, the hunter shouldn't eat the clams from the walrus's stomach. And I never thought about that before. So I think just like, yeah, local impacts of day-to-day -day life um, and the way of living out there is something that we should have a focus on besides just like quote unquote community engagement in a broad sense. Absolutely. Thanks, Harmony. I'm waiting to see if we leave a moment silent, if people will chime in. If you're not sure how to raise your hand, you can also just unmute yourself and ask your question or type it in the chat. I did it, I raised my hand. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to ask this question. I'm following up on what was just said in something that I struggle with as a, as a scientist doing a pretty large project provide, that has, that's generating this information that people care about. And Gay and I have talked about this and, and Dawn Anderson and all of us, like how do we communicate this to the, to the communities, defining communities, however you define them. Um, and you know what, what I think would be helpful, I don't know if it's possible, but if there was an actual, this is what you do when you have information in the Bering Sea, the Chuck G C, the, you know, wherever. This is how you reach the people that we want to reach about this. Um, because it's hard from, I, I mean, I'm doing really well working through through gay and the collaborators out there, but maybe if there was an actual, and maybe this group could create that, I don't know, step by step, this is how you communicate this information um, when you have something critical to share about the Arctic environment. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense, Kathy. And, um, you know, from an NPRB perspective, I've struggled with that as well. There is no resource like that that um, exists for every region that will help you make sure you get it right. Um, and I think some of this is, you know, our community sharing lessons learned about what's worked, where have we run into criticism because we've haven't done it right and we didn't know the right way to do it. Um, we could, you know, one of one of um, those kind of tangible objectives that we maybe could think about under the first iteration of the implementation plan is trying to put together some sort of resource like that. We'd have to recognize that it is never going to be comprehensive. And it's, you know, some of this, like I mentioned earlier, whether you're a federal agency dealing with government to government versus a academic researcher, it's going to look a little bit different in every case, but at least, you know, maybe an objective could be to um, have some sort of a, a resource that that would be a good starting point for folks. Um, yeah, we could think about that. And I, I mean, I guess the difficult part would be keeping that updated with the correct point of contact for each group and that that's probably what has prevented this from happening is that that is dynamic. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And most regions, there is a point of contact for, you know, the general IRI tribal council office, but there, even in each region, I found that there is not uh, an up-to-date resource on who is the current tribal council president. You have to call every single tribal council and ask that question before you send a letter if you want to make sure it's addressed properly. Um, recently, this fall, MPRB did that. <laughs> we put together a list of 150 different um, contacts in the, in the um, in, throughout Alaska to get a letter out. Um, but it, it is quite a bit of work, and it that it isn't. Um, every six months you may have to do it again. Um, so it does become difficult, but we can at least point people to websites where you can find the, the point of contact for the tribal council office, for example. Can I ask kind of a dumb question that, that moves away from this a little bit, but in terms of thinking about the IRBIC priorities and goals. Is there a way that IRBIC then can recommend to funding agencies that these particular goals match with search or match with Aon or match with NPRB? How do we go forward? How do we move this Arctic research plan forward? And forgive my ignorance. No, you're actually, you're, you're, no question is dumb and no and ignorance is not the issue here. Um, there is a, every two years of this, this is an implementation plan coming out. And that actually is in the really beginning stages of this, is how to address some of these core parts that are in this five-year plan. And maybe Kathy, you've been in privy on some of these discussions. That would be the mechanism for the agency to see which ones are pertinent across them and, and whether or not they could put, I think, how they're gonna implement those. Cause they really do uh, by agreeing to be part of this is they want to be able to address some of those, those questions. Am I right there? And isn't that why there's a more fluid implementation plan now, Kathy? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, that that is the the thought and actually Kate, that was a really good question. And I think with, um, you know, IARPIC, um, you know, there's a, a group, uh, a staff group, and a you know biennial implementation plan steering uh, committee. Um, and I actually happen to sit on both of those. And I, I think that is like a, a tangible product um, that we could produce of of taking the ideas that we're hearing um, that need to be you know better understood um, more quickly on the ecosystem, and then matching it with potential um, funders. And I know that. IRPIC's done a really good job. You know, now they're representing, I think, 18 different federal agencies because I think the Denali Commission and HUD is going to be involved. But it's really like, you know, making something useful out of all of these conversations and the communities that we're building and, and tracking that in a meaningful way. So, Kate, I actually think that's um, a great comment for today, you know, and something that I'll, um, you know, make sure that we follow up on um, at, what, at what level and then um, on what you know, sort of mechanisms, um, you know, just from um, working with one of the uh, federal um, research programs for a number of years, I know that uh, a lot of people within the federal family are really figuring out how to best support indigenous led research. And I'm not saying like, just uh, intellectually support it or philosophically support it, but like, what are the mechanisms, um, the financial mechanisms to allow that to happen? And um, it's a challenge because each federal agency has their own set of like bonding regulations. Um, and um, I think we're really trying to take a, a broad look at it. And then it goes, you know, those decisions really go far up the chain um, to everybody, not just, um, you know, how do you create those synergies um, and I'll tell federal agencies that might have, you know, um, I guess a regulatory mandate that seemed to fit under that hopper of information. But I think it can, I think the communication um, could be better internally and then described better externally back to, you know, these communities of practice that we're trying to, to generate. And, and if the plan, you know, in my presentation, I, um, you know, I think I use the term nimble and I also work for a federal agency and, you know, nimble is usually not a, a descriptor for the government. Uh, we're a big boat. It takes a long time to move. 
Uh, but at the same time, if our, if our intent is to, to change that a little bit and identify priorities over two years, we need to have a, uh, I think, a better action plan. So, you know, I, I'll make sure I personally carry that message. So I have a question as well, uh, keeping in line with what may be ignorant questions. I'm wondering, in terms of a two-year implementation plan, how does this impact the researchers writing proposals? And I'm thinking particularly of young researchers. You know, is, is this going to provide the, the, the type of guidance that they need, um, you know, to write a more effective proposal, you know, and, and somehow how are they brought into this whole process and even educated with all this? And, and, and along those lines, you know, you, you asked the question, what are the pressing research topics for the next two years? And, and my immediate thought was the next two years, well, gosh, it takes a year to get a proposal funded if it gets funded the first time. Ship schedules are also being decided, you know, at least a year or maybe a year and a half and, you know, from now. So, so I'm also wondering, you know, what exactly do we mean by this two year process when, you know, it's, it's almost like you got to think longer term in, in order to do your research. So. Yeah, Bob, really good questions. And I don't have a, you know, specific answer, but things don't, you know, happen um, that quickly. But I think, you know, if, if the intent, um, you know, if IARPIC is seen as, you know, a mechanism to have these important discussions, you know, across federal agencies and across everyone, um, is how do we, um, you know, demonstrate, I guess the, you know, I'm just thinking, I guess, in the plan itself of like, you know, they want to, they are hoping that we provide, you know, milestones and deliverables um, to say how, how well we're doing it. Then I think we do need to um, make sure uh, that, you know, key things that we want to have deeper understanding of are conveyed. And then we have to like mechanistically figure out how to make it happen. And I know that um, one of the uh, foundational areas is that they're really trying to engage the early career scientists. And I think um, uh, Kaya Ricks from NOAA is um, one of the leads on that. And I think that's a really important, um, I guess, thing to convey uh, back to Kaya and others of, of how does this really apply and how do we um, train um, the next generation of scientists how to apply um, two RFPs as they come out in a meaningful way. And if, if the trend is going to be, you know, um, science for applied management use um, to educate everyone, what does that mean? You know, I mean, I think that you and, you know, Jackie and all of the experts on the phone here can think from, you know, if you're in academic, academia, from your perspective of the ecosystem, what's important to understand. And then it's really hard to sometimes bend that across you know, a funder that has a specific management need. And I think uh, that's a, a specific set of discussions I think we need to pursue here within the Marine Ecosystem Collaboration Team is starting to bridge that gap a little bit. And I was gonna say, you know, as, as we try to come up with some suggestions for tangible objectives or deliverables in the first, you know, for the first iteration of the implementation plan. What are those things that we could focus on in the next couple of years where we can make use of projects that are already ongoing and, and demonstrate how they are relevant to addressing these new priority areas under this new five-year Arctic research plan? And how, how can our community help demonstrate how we can effectively improve communication to make sure collectively we're all aware of the opportunities to coordinate and, and then collaborate in the, at the next stage with potentially increased funding. So, you know, for example, our team over the last couple of years has hosted some conversations about how can we improve communication and coordination among observational scientists, um, you know, the Bob Pickards and the Don Andersons of the world who are going out on ships and collecting data and the um, and the folks um, working on building um, and operationalizing models. I'm glad to see Ann Hollowood is here, for example, and how can 
the the efforts of, of the modeling community to do things like um, better develop the MOM6 model and add things like biogeochemistry. How can we improve communication and coordination among those communities of people to really improve our predictive capacity? And how can we take data we already have in hand and use it to do things like verify and validate models and look at where, where do we know we need more information? And then how can we then put that down on paper to hopefully, you know, a few years out, get the ball rolling to address that. Um, and same for things like um, satellite and remote sensing algorithms. How can we make use of data in hand? Um, things like, you know, Jackie and the um, DBO group are going to be hosting a, a webinar coming up soon, I think next month on, on what the DBO has been doing, for example, to interact with the observational sciences there and the remote sensing community. How can, how can we take what we're already doing, demonstrate how it's relevant to the priorities in the plan, and then move towards making suggestions for where funding is needed to, to move the ball forward? So Danielle, that's great. And, and, and also Kathy, thanks for your, for your response. Um, so, so I'll just throw something else out there that I, that I put on my form, you know, and because I was thinking about what's pressing in two years, within the next two years. And, and uh, Danielle reminded me when she was talking about getting observation and models to, to talk to each other more effectively. So um, I know everyone's making such an amazing effort now to get our data archived here right, at various data centers, and that's really fantastic. But when you get right down to when you want to do your project that integrates lots of different data, either it's just all physical data or, or different types of data, you know, you got to grab what you need and get it into some type of a, a working, you know, product or form. And, and, and here's an example. A couple of years ago, Seth Danielson at UAF led this effort where he grabbed like every hydrogra hydrographic cast ever, ever taken in the Chukchi uh, and Bering Seas by, you know, pulling information from the World Ocean Database, from UDASH, from his Russian colleagues, whatever. An incredible product. My group had done something similar. We merged our products together and we had this incredible database that's so powerful for modelers to use or for observationists to use to, to you know, just engage a whole bunch of different things. But gosh, gosh, that, it, that was two years ago. And, and now we've had two more years of gobs of data, more and more you know, platforms and ships collecting data, and we need to keep these things going. And it's not just a matter of submitting to the databases. It's a matter of sort of you know, polling on them and, and, and getting a product that's really usable for a modeler, and again, particularly young scientists to be able to, to access this kind of thing. We really need that to, to continue, and it's not clear to me who's gonna do it and who's gonna fund it, but I think there's a really, really strong need for that going forward. That's my, my, my spiel from my soapbox here, thanks. <laughs> No, I, I think what you're saying is right, Bob, because that is, I mean, it's a synthesis product, right? That then really, and I think we've had that to the end of some of these big programs, but every, for example, PACMARS and MPRD, this for the Pacific Marine Synthesis, but it's now old, all right, until you add on it. So it's it's not, uh, it, it, needs, it needs an investment that is ongoing. And that is a commitment that has to come from the funders to do, you know, and, uh, because we collect, you know, as oceanographers, you know this, we're out there doing observing and we, and then you want to write their papers, but it is of real value to have that, those the composite data and they take time and it takes money to do. And? No, I was just going to say that I have to leave, um, but I've really enjoyed this meeting. Um, I do think this issue of data archiving is an important one. And um, conversations with AUS, I think, are in a partnership, perhaps, between NPRB and AUS to create a, uh, there are tools now for making it relatively easy for data owners to um, load information into a common data format. And so uh, some utilizing the existing tools that have been developed and then finding a 
a, a location where that information could be served would be certainly forthcoming and useful to not only the modelers, but the observationalists as well. And so maybe a conversation with AACE would be, I don't know, maybe somebody on this call is from AACE. So I've got to run, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and the only thing I would add to Anne what just said, because NPRB, I mean, NSF just had a big call about using big data to make these types. So, I mean, I think maybe even just where, I think we, I don't know which meeting I talked about it, but having links to where some of these calls are just as an information resource that IR could at least have available, you know, so people could say, bye-bye, that could say, these are things that are ongoing, you know, where you might be able to go for just what Anne was saying or what, what Bob was saying. Uh, that if there's a funding call for it to look at these data sets and make synthesis products. So that's all I'm, I'm thinking of. Maybe that's one thing we can do it. I at least have an inf a live information page uh, that could be kept up by the different, actually it should be tasked to the agencies to do. But I mean, we all get our announcements for calls for proposals, but maybe there's some high level ones related to this topic from observations to modeling that require large data sets that we might be able to at least say, so people could hit on IRPIC and say, okay, I, I'm gonna periodically check that. And, and there's a question in there, and I know we have to get off here. Two things that I would say is that an example of all these, I mean, I could talk about how IRPIC and the Pacific Arctic Group and the DBO, the distributed biological benefited from having this collaborative talks across a variety of meetings. Uh, but that's a big scale that goes beyond, you know, you, somebody wanted a template example of high ARPIC has facilitated, um, but it was, a, it took a lot of time. It wasn't just high ARPIC to make some of these big programs go. The second thing I would say, because I know we're supposed to at some point give an update is that the Arctic Science Summit Week has free online meeting. We are developing the Atlantic DBO, the European side is and the Canada at, at Davis Strait and the Baffin Bay. So it'd be open discussions, but it's free. Uh, they just closed it to Russians though. I would say that, that just happened this morning. So nobody can get online from a Russian institution. I'm not gonna go down politics right now, but everybody else can join online free. So just go to ASSW 22 for international aspects of science planning. There's, I wanted to make that announcement before we shut. Yes, Kathy, I probably need to tie up. Yeah, I think um, we do have, We do have to wrap up. And I realize that an hour to have such a, a, a deep uh, conversation isn't where we're asking for your inputs, um, probably isn't enough time. But I'm hoping um, that you would consider uh, you know, filling out that survey that we um, did. I think um, we can uh, send out an email, but I think it's also, uh, there's a link um, in the chat, and uh, if we could uh, capture any of, um, you know, some specific, uh, you know, information you'd like to, to provide to us um, in writing. Again, I know that's an hour of your time to join us on the webinar today, and then we're asking you a little bit more time. Um, that would be really helpful for us. Anything to add in, Danielle? Oh, just my sincere thanks to all of you for taking the time to participate and uh, all of you who may be watching the recording after the fact, thanks for taking the time to provide us your input. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing your ideas about how we can support you in the next five years. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.